Hey guys, this is Pastor Ryan Cole here. I'm so glad that you've joined me for Breaking Through the Noise. This is a broadcast that I stream out every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time with a fresh word from God to help cut through the clutter of all of the noise that is coming at us through media or social media or through the events of the world to really bring truth to the table and help you make sense of life And this new series that I'm in is called um, Build Your Church. It's actually a series that's going to be recorded live from the Living Room Congregation every Sunday. And I'm going to be streaming it to you guys on Tuesdays. The Living Room Congregation is an amazing church here in the upstate of South Carolina that I'm leading along with my wife and Pastor Stephen and Lori Ward, uh, such phenomenal leaders, and we have an amazing church. If you want to find out how to visit the church or get involved in some way, if you're here in the area and want to check us out, you can find out more information on social media at The Living Room Congregation or online at thelivingroomcongregation.com. You can also give into this ministry. You can sow into what, what we're doing. And if you want to check out my ministry, go to ryancoleempowerment.com. There you can connect to resources and give to that ministry as well. But I want you to stay with us for the next several weeks as we are going to be talking about God's original intent for the church and how we in our modern ways have gotten off track from the way that God intended the church to operate. What is the purpose of the church? Not only in light of recent events that have shaken the world, but in general for this generation to see the manifestation of the culture of the kingdom of heaven. Well, we're going to be talking about that and we're going to be digging into the fivefold ministry, the gifts of the spirit, the operation of the church, how we're supposed to function. So I want you to stick with us for the next several weeks for this series, Build Your Church. And without further ado, let's jump right in from Greenville, South Carolina. This is the Living Room Congregation. Enjoy. I can just feel such a a density of his presence in the room right now. And I know you can feel it too. There's such safety in the presence of the Lord, amen. The house of the Lord is the safest place that you can be because it's where his presence is. And when I say the house of the Lord, and even as we discuss build your church, (laughs) I'm not talking about the four walls of this building, right? And all of the beautiful things that this place has given us over the last almost year, probably I don't know how many months we've officially been in this building, but we felt it necessary as we're such a young church, but in blazing ancient trails, that's what the Lord told me a couple weeks ago was our assignment as a church, blazing ancient trails. That means we're apostolic and we're prophetic. But what I saw for us was not a new path that we were blazing, but an ancient path that had been overgrown because of lack of use. And the church has gone corporately in a million different directions. And we've built according to our pattern, we've built according to our preference, But I truly believe that when the Lord placed the living room congregation in our hearts, that he was bringing us back to the foundation of what the New Testament church built as we create cultures of empowerment from home to home so that every single living room is a place where the culture of the kingdom of heaven is manifested. And we can disciple our sons and daughter, daughters with the message of the kingdom And so that when they become older, they can go into the world as a carrier of God's glory. The goal is glory. I want you to say that. The goal is glory. What is the glory of God? It's the culture of heaven. It's his likeness. It's his goodness. It's the density of his presence. It's his character and nature, the glory of the Lord. And so as we're building the church, we're building it upon a sure foundation because Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Amen. We talked about the table 
The table, as we started in Easter, the table is the foundation of our culture in this, in this season, not only here, but as we're blazing those ancient trails, bringing us back to the table, the table of the Lord. Discipleship doesn't happen in gatherings like this per se, but discipleship happens behind tables, in dining rooms, in your home, in restaurants, as we create this culture where you and I can build each other up, build your church. The table of the Lord. But as we talk about building your church, we have to get out of our mind the way that we have done church all of our lives in religious settings. Because the fact of the matter is, there can be an establishment, an institution that carries a name while vacant of the glory of that name that they proclaim. I see in the book of Ezekiel, there's a couple of passages I want you to take out your Bible. I see in the book of Ezekiel this story of the children of Israel as they are a broken kingdom... They have two different sections of the kingdom. And that fracture in the kingdom left them open and susceptible to external attack. I hope you're hearing me. So you had the northern kingdom and you had, Ju- you had Ju- Ju- Judah, the kingdom of Judah. You had two different parts. Essentially, one unified kingdom was fractured like a broken bone, you can say. One piece pulled from the other, and this left an open void for um, Babylon to come in and begin to take them captive and pull them into a worldly culture. And Ezekiel was one of the most creative, the most prophetic people in the Bible, but he used his prophetic gift in creative ways. He was a pantomime. He would create these illustrations with his body, with different items to make proclamations to the children of Israel. And we see for the most part of that book, he's letting the children of Israel know where the fractures had taken place in the church. And an interesting thing happens when he gets to Babylon. He has this open vision and in this open vision, he sees the glory of the God, the glory of God resting in Babylon. They still had the tabernacle set up. It was still there. Why was the glory of God in Babylon? Why wasn't it over the mercy seat where the tabernacle had been put together? Why was it in Babylon? And Ezekiel was confounded by seeing this. But as the Lord began to unveil the the indiscretions of the nation of Israel, he began to understand, listen, we could be doing church all day long. We could be singing the most beautiful of melodies, going through our rituals, and unknown to us, the glory of God has lifted And it's scary to say that that happens very frequently in churches. Why can we not sustain a move of God? Is it because we turn it inwards on ourselves? Is it because we grow uh, uh, so fond of the personalities that initiated whatever move of God was occurring? And I see this in the church, in the Western world in particular, that there is function, but no duplication. There is activity, but there is no presence. There is no multiplication of sons. And this is what Ezekiel saw. As they were taken into the world, and we see this now, people leaving the church, going into the world, but the glory of God is there to entreat them. Listen, if, if his people are not going to cooperate, God will go into the world and get whoever is available. Because God is looking for those who are saying, yes, Lord, I'm available. He'll take them right in the midst of, of uh, precarious situations, to say the least. Sinful lifestyles. And he will take and use them for his glory. But I believe that the living room congregation is, is the ones who will be there to train those that God is bringing in. The Lord gave me a prophetic word uh, last year. Um, in 2020, as we were 
turning into the new decade that we had four and a half years to rebuild a, an educational institution in the church because that was our original mission. And that we would have an onslaught of chaos that would come against us after those four and a half years. And our numbers, who people who claim Christianity as we know it, would dwindle. But in those five years, we would disciple such an army. It may be small, but an army of believers who would have the true revelation of the kingdom. And then at the turn of the next decade, we would see a mass turning back of people who got saved in church but were never truly discipled. And when the pressure comes, they're going to easily turn away. But we don't have to worry because God is giving us the opportunity through the living room congregation to, to build this kind of community that educates and disciples people according to the, the ways and the laws and the virtues of God's kingdom. And we're going to see a mighty wave of returning, and we're going to be ready for it. Amen? But right now, we're in those years of building. Somebody say, build your church. Just as Ezekiel saw, the children of Israel had turned away, and he goes through in that entire first part of the book, talking about why and what happened and all of the things that, 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 that occurred there you see that he saw the glory of God, and then he started listing out the accusations against Israel. And then he started talking about their hardened heart and their refusal to listen. And then he started talking about how Israel, in fact, invited idols into the, the, the temple and the tabernacle. We see out in the outer court, they brought in foreign gods and just set them up. And, and it was one little piece at a time, and it happened slowly, but they begin to defile the tabernacle. And, and then we see judgment, the, the word of judgment come in Ezekiel chapter 12 to 24. And then in verses, I mean chapters 34 onward, we begin to see the promise, the hope that was going to come to Israel and in particular, Ezekiel chapter 37 is where I want to read from today as we talk about build your church. Everybody turn to Ezekiel 37 and let me know when you're there. Yes. You there? The dry bones live. Starting at verse 1. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. You shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together, bone to bone. I love that. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews, and that's the, the joints and the marrow, and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. There was a structure, but no life. Mm. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, not a fractured house, not one kingdom in the south and one kingdom in the north, but a whole house. 
Do you understand that what God is doing in the living room congregation is not about the numbers that we can amass in and of ourselves, but a mighty unification in the, in the body of Christ around the world? That we would not be separated among denominational lines, but we would become the church of Jesus Christ. They indeed say, verse 11, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God. Can you imagine them standing there in full flesh and blood, no longer bones sitting on the ground, yet they themselves could not see what was happening to them. They could not see that they had been made whole. And they turned back to him and said, we're just dry bones. What are we going to do? They didn't take the time to look and see that they had been restored. Mm. Can you hear the prophetic word in this? Therefore prophesy to them and say, thus says the Lord, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. As I was thinking about uh, the foundation of the church, I was studying through the book of Ephesians. Now, I'm going to parallel this here in a minute, but I'm going to explain to you why. We see in the book of Ezekiel this clear prophetic depiction of of things to come as the Lord desired to bring the children of Israel back together from their broken state. And we actually never fully see that manifest. However, we do see a, a manifestation of a very similar promise occur, obviously, through the blood of Jesus and his finished work as The Jews and the Gentiles, a broken people, a fractured people in the earth, are brought into unity as one body. And I begin to see the book of Ephesians, which is the quintessential blueprint for the church. It is the premier book out of all of the writings of Paul that we can go to and see the instructions as to how we're to build the church and what our purpose is. And I saw this parallel, not only in the language, but in the order, in the way that Paul poetically laid out this a picture of what was going on. You see in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 and 2, and even part of 3, you see him set up the dilemma. Ephesians chapter 1 is actually set up in a Jewish poetic way in a traditional Jewish poem kind of way, where it sets the stage for the redemption of humanity, where he begins to talk about how we were dead and buried in the ground, how we were lost and broken, but for the grace of God. We have been redeemed and resurrected from the dead. We have been raised to new life in Jesus Christ. And and then he starts to use the same kind of language that we see in Ezekiel 37 when he began to prophesy to the bones. And he started talking about we as the body of Christ and each joint supplying. The book of Ephesians is important for us to read, and it's very short, and I want to challenge each one of you to go home and read it, even if you've read it before. Some of the chapters, and there's only six, some of the chapters are only like 19 verses, so you can read it in one sitting. But hidden within all of those verses is such profound revelation as we see the setup, we see the individual redemption of us as human beings in our personal relationship with God and coming into right standing with him through our relationship with Jesus Christ. But then we see how we as individuals fit neatly together in this new construction that God has built called the church or the body of Christ, the called out ones, the ecclesia. That's the Greek word, the called out ones. And specifically it means a gathering of governors. A gathering of governors. That means he's raising up leaders who will go and carry the culture of the kingdom of heaven into every system of the world. 
I want to challenge you to think of ministry differently. Ministry does not happen in settings like this. This is the equipping time for the work of the ministry. We see the fivefold ministry gifts, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist, along with all of these other gifts, and we see they are there for the equipping and the edifying of the church, Ephesians chapter 3. For what? The work of the ministry. That means when you come into a gathering like this, you're coming as a leader, you're coming as a governor, you're coming as an influencer, no matter where God has planted you in the world, so that you can go out and be yeast in this world and bring the culture of the kingdom of heaven. I've already said a mouthful. Are y'all getting this? The ministry happens when we step outside of these doors. And the book of Ephesians is so profound because he talks about our individual situation in Ephesians 1 and 2. And then you get to Ephesians 3 and he said, but you're not in it alone. I've connected you with other believers who have experienced the same kind of transformation you have. And as you come together... and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he says it right there, Ephesians 3, 10 to 11. What is the purpose of the church? It's an eternal purpose which he purposed before the foundations of the world that we would do what? We would show forth the manifold wisdom of God where to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Are you hearing me? The systems of this world, because of the fallen state of Adam, are operated. It's a spiritual dimension that's going on. It's not about the earth, the, the terra firma that you walk on, but the world is a different word. It's the word cosmos, and it's a spiritual entity. If you would liken it to a human being, it's like saying you have a brain, but you also have a mind. Your mind is a spiritual faculty, and it's the connecting point between heaven and earth. That's where every, uh, every bit of spiritual warfare happens, is in your mind. So the world is likened to the mind in as much as the earth is likened to your brain. And that's why the repentance process is important so that you have a transformation of the way that you think. Starting from a spiritual place and working its way through every neural firing in your brain. Ooh. And in, in having that transformation experience... God begins to awaken you to a new culture, a new way of life that is shared in environments just like this. Not only when we come together and have service and we feel the environment of heaven here, but when I invite you over to my house and we're talking about the things of the Lord. And not in some out, out there kind of way, but in a very relevant way as to how the Lord's working through me in my kid's life. How the Lord's working through me on my job. How the Lord's working through me in my community. And edging each other on in the faith to say, I believe that you're called to do this. And that's where we sing to one another and we prophesy to one another. And we build each other up in these houses of faith. That's why our church, house churches are so important. And, and we've been challenging you through the teaching on the table to invite people into your own space, that this happens organically. And I pray that you're continuing to do that. Are you continuing to do that? If I were to put you on the spot and say, who have you invited to the table? Would it make you feel uncomfortable? Would you say, no, I've actually invited people to the table? Because that's where the church is built. It says every joint supplies in Ephesians chapter 4. 
And this is where we get into from Ephesians 3 into Ephesians 4 and 5. He starts dealing with the interworkings of our relationships. He deals with co-working relationships. He deals with the marriage. He deals with how we raise our children and interact with our parents, even as adults. He goes into all of that because he knows that every problem is a people problem. Every problem is a people problem. You can't name to me a problem that isn't a people problem. So he's giving you all of these tools in the book of Ephesians to be able to deal with these relationships. And then in Ephesians chapter 6 is the one we always love to preach about. Put on the full armor of God, right? Because I'm sending you out as light in a dark place. But you're going to go out and stand. I'm going to work through you, but it's not going to take a lot of effort. You're going to stand as occupational troops to carry the culture of the kingdom of heaven into your sphere of influence. And he starts breaking down the hierarchies of the kingdom of darkness in Ephesians chapter 6. See, most of us put that at the first, right in front of us, right? We would have put that Ephesians chapter 1 because we like to talk about the devil, We like to point fingers. But he says, before I get you to the point of understanding all of these hierarchies of demonic forces that are real, principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, and he's not talking about a Hollywood depiction of a demonic force. He's talking about in the world. There's principalities that are ruling over systems. There's powers that are ruling over leaders. There's spiritual wickedness in high places. And if you're going to be sent out into the world, you're going to have to know how to deal with them. But you're not going to have to fight them because the finished work in Jesus Christ already took care of it. But you're going to be able to stand in the authority, not because of who you are, but because you can look to the hills from which cometh your help and know that your help comes from the Lord. And when you get in environments like this, no matter what pressure you've been feeling from those demonic forces, you can say, but I've got a marriage that can stand against the pressure. I've got relationships in church that can stand against the pressure. My children children and I have good standing and we can stand against the pressure. Listen, the enemy doesn't have to attack you on your job or out there in the world or you think you have this big intercessory assignment. Listen, all he has to do is drive a wedge between you and your wife or drive a wedge between you and your children or get you competing with the person on your left and right in church who has got the most dramatic of gifts. So I can compete with them. We preachers do it all the time. But you do it on your job too. You're competing. We've been programmed to compete. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that every joint supplies. That means you could be a full-fashioned leg sitting over in the corner by yourself and have nowhere to go. Because the supply happens at the joints. The supply happens when we connect. The supply happens when we are no longer fractured and jealous of one another's giftings. But we can see the uniqueness inside of each other. And we can call to that power and potential without feeling intimidated that you're going to pass me by. Or people are going to like you more than they like me. Or you're going to have a more uh, dramatic gift than me. I hope you're hearing me today. If we're going to build the church, we have to know. How, what are the blueprints? This is the book of Ephesians. And I see Ephesians chapter 2 is a direct parallel to what Ezekiel saw in poetic language. I just want to read this and think of Ezekiel chapter 37 as I'm reading Ephesians chapter 2. And you, and you who... He made alive who were dead in trespass and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the what? The prince and the power of the air. We're talking about world systems. And the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we are once, we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. 
But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespass, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by the grace of God you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. This is kingdom language. You were an alien from the commonwealth, the culture that I had created through my people, Israel. You were strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope. Remember what they said standing there? We're dry bones. We have no hope. And without God in the world... But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, Healing the fractured bone, making peace, as we saw in Ezekiel chapter 37. Even after that, we see after the valley of dry bones, the Lord uses Ezekiel to to pick up two pieces of sticks that represents both sides of the kingdom that had been fractured, right? And he began to proclaim that they again would be one, and we see this here again. Verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Christ is our cornerstone. Now therefore you no longer are strangers and foreigners. Can somebody say amen? But fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That means you're grafted in. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows. Have you ever seen a building grow? That's because this is not a brick and mortar building, but this is lively stones. Fitted together, growing into the holy temple of the Lord. In whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. The book of Ephesians is important, and over the next several weeks, we're going to get into all of the details of what makes a church. Not church as we've known it, but taking us back. We're going back to the future. (laughs) We're going back to God's original intent. So that each one of us can be awakened from the slumber, from the amnesia that the enemy gives us because we're born into sin, right? Right? And we're awakened to say, hey, I'm royalty. I'm a part of the family of God. I'm a part of the kingdom. I'm a manifestation. I'm a channel by which heaven invades earth. And we're going to talk about all of the unique gifts that he has placed. There's 23 gifts that are listed in the New Testament in three different books of the Bible. We're going to talk about all that. The gifts of administration, helps and a service and, and also the, the power gifts, the prophetic. We're going to talk about gifts of healings and miracles. We're going to pull that out in each one of you and we're going to break the spirit of competition. We're going to break that in the church. That's the reason. That's the reason why we can't pass on ministries. That's the reason why we miss our calling and that's the reason why so many of us are striving it's the spirit of an orphan that we've been placed here to destroy you are a son of God you are his child and you have a unique gifting in fact your gifting is so unique it's a divine orchestra each person plays a part and when you have an understanding that God is not calling you to success 
but to live a life of significance. If you keep chasing success, you're going to always be competing. And you're going to be always chasing after a finish line that the world keeps pushing further away. But in the body of Christ, we're not running against one another. We're running together. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats in the air, but I discipline my body. Bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be qual- become disqualified. I've always been fascinated about that scripture. And if you look at it through the lens of the world, it, it puts us competing with one another. To say that there's one prize and one winner, and we've all got to run to obtain it. No. But if you look at it through the context of the kingdom, who is the one? The one body? One spirit? It's our collective anointings, our collective giftings, our unity that enables us to run the race that is set before us. You've got a unique part to play that nobody else can play. You've got a unique gift that nobody else has. You've got something inside of you that nobody can compete with. And the moment that you start trying to compete, you begin to step outside of the anointing that God places upon your life. I love Pastor Stephen says all the time, God can only anoint the real you. And it's so true. When we try to compete, we lose sight of what God has for us to leave a significant mark on the world. And we're all running together. This is a divine orchestra. You've got the the string section. You've got the brass. You've got the winds. You've got the percussions. I know the band is hearing me, right? And the Holy Spirit is the divine conductor, orchestrating it all together, right? Right? Unity is not uniformity. I'll say that again. Unity is not uniformity, right? But it's harmony. It's harmony with the diversity of our gifts. Because he said, we all have a different gift, but it's one Lord, one spirit, one faith, one baptism. We're combined. How does an orchestra come together to play such a beautiful symphony? It's because they're all in tune to the same rhythm the same key, the same frequency that they're playing on. But the brass section sounds a whole lot different from the string section. And sure, they sound beautiful apart, but when you bring them together, I'm just going to give you guys one of my dreams. One of my dreams one day is to stand and sing in front of a big orchestra. That's just my little personal dream. (laughs) This is the orchestra that God has made. You know the scripture, this is the day that the Lord has made. That word made, it means orchestrated. Build your church. You have such a unique gift on the inside of you. Why would you ever try to compete with anybody else? I did a little math, and I'm ending right here. I did a little math right before the service, and you guys would be proud of me. I said, if there are 23 gifts of the Spirit, how many combinations is this? How many different unique combinations can you make with just 23 gifts? I want you to put that number on the screen. It says big number. There you go. 20 nonillion, 880 octillion, 467 septillion, 999 sextillion, 847 quintillion, 912 quadrillion, 34 trillion, 355 billion, 32 million, 910,567 different ways that you could be gifted. There's only 7 billion people in the world. You are going to diminish the uniqueness of your gifting to compete with somebody else? And when we build 
his church, we need your unique footprint. We need exactly what you bring to the table. We need the unique combination of all the spiritual gifts that God has given you with all the spiritual gifts he's given us so that we can be jointly fitted with every joint supplying. Build your church. Somebody say, build your church. Say, I'm not competing with anybody. God's got a plan for my life. It's a unique plan. You're prophetic. I can feel it in you. Would you stand to your feet? Well, guys, I'm so glad that you were with us tonight for this message. It was a broadcast from what we experienced on Sunday. If you want to join us in person, you can go to the livingroomcongregation.com and find out all the times and the locations, et cetera, and how you can connect to this church here in Greenville, South Carolina. You can give to this church, especially if you're already a part and you're watching this, maybe you missed Sunday and you want to give, make sure you give right there at the livingroomcongregation.com. But hey, if you want to find out more about my ministry, what my wife and I do for full time um, in doing marriage ministry, spiritual growth, helping you discover your purpose. A lot of great resources are available at RyanColeEmpowerment.com. We want you to continue with us on this journey as we continue unfolding this message about how we are to, are to build the church, the church that Jesus built, the church that he's building. We're going to be a part of that building process. So stick with us as we're going to be releasing more in this series every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time on this broadcast, Breaking Through the Noise. Thank you again for joining me. A comment, let me know how this message impacted you tonight. And um, we're always praying for you. Father, I thank you for those who are watching, Lord who may be experiencing all kinds of battles in their own life and they're trying to put the pieces of their own lives together. Help them to realize, God, that as they uh, as they realize their identity in you, that they can, can too build the church, God, bringing heaven to earth, Lord, starting in their home, that it doesn't have to be just in a four walls of a building, but in the community right where they're at, that they can be a part of building your church in their family as they raise their children as they interact with their spouse, as they go to their jobs, that they are a catalyst for heaven touching earth, that they are the place where your glory is revealed. I bless those watching now. Thank you for your healing power that moves through this broadcast to whatever ailment they may be dealing with, whether it be physical or emotional or mental. God, I decree and declare your healing right now flows in the name of Jesus. And I bless those who are giving into this church and into this ministry right now. Father, that you are the one who will give them creative ideas, innovative strategies, helping them to prosper in their career, helping them to prosper in their businesses and ministries, God. I bless them now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, I'll see you next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Uh, make sure you hit that share button. If you're on YouTube, hit subscribe. God bless you.